Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, today we're going to cover Chapter 13, Policing Special Pro Populations and, and Problems. Um, and so um, we're going to talk primarily about uh, mental illness, domestic violence, immigrants or immigration, and human trafficking. And we're also going to talk briefly about um, crime in the elderly. So um, let's get started. So what is a special population within our communities with regard to policing? So um, uh, special populations are individuals or groups within our communities that have special considerations that make them more vulnerable in terms of victimization and or are at greater risk of victimization. Um, special populations are not those protected classes such as race, ethnicities, religions, or sexual orientation. Within each segment of, the, of our society, including those uh, protected classes, there are special populations. For example, mental illness can strike anyone, whether it's you're white, black, uh, whether you're Latino, Asian, um, Christian, uh, Muslim, Jewish, Hindu, or whether you're gay or straight. Um, so that's what I mean. So these uh, special populations are, you know, these special considerations within all of our members of society. Spe special populations are common in all societies and are part of all of our communities. Um, these special populations appear in all walks of life, classes, races, ethnicities, or orientations. And special populations in terms of policing is crisis management at a macro human level that requires special skills and understandings. And that's some of the things we're going to talk about today. So uh, police and uh, the mentally ill. So really, these numbers, you know, kind of go up and down. And I would suspect that in today's society, we estimate that 20 to 40 percent of all police calls for service involve a mentally ill person. And those numbers may go up or down depending on where you work um, and your uh you know, your patrol area, your community, some communities are more predisposed to mental illness than others. Um, and uh, we can, you know, shed light on some of those examples. If you remember early on, I think I showed you guys a video uh, or at least uh, put the link in there. And it's probably the same link that we're looking at here at the bottom. So um, just cut this, uh, copy this link and paste it into your browser and um, it talks about mental illness in policing. For example, in Idaho, you know, um, their mental illness rate is, uh, is extremely high and suicide due to mental illness is, you know, the leading cause of death between uh, individuals between the ages of 18 and 30. So um, they have a serious crisis. Uh, San Francisco also has a serious mental illness uh, health crisis and so that um, forty percent may you know be as close to seventy percent um, depending on you know the the city you work and the the beat area within your jurisdiction. Um, and another thing to consider is that more than seventy percent of the inmates in jails or state penitentiaries or prisons have some sort of mental illness. Some are diagnosed, some are not. So, you know, those numbers are pretty pretty tight because those people who come in for services are diagnosed and each one of these correctional facilities knows how many people they have and the percentages of people they have under mental health care or supervision. And so they though that's seventy percent came from the same communities that were policing. So you can see how there is a correlation between that 20 and 40% of all calls for service, and then 90% um, of uh, patrol officers will come in contact with a mentally ill person in crisis at least once a month. And that's 70% of inmates 
uh, that are in correctional facilities or jails. So you can see, uh, like I said earlier, the correlation between mental illness and um, contact with the criminal justice system. Deinstitutionalization of mental health centers during the late 1900s, um, and you know what I'm saying saying is there was a there was a big push um, from about uh, the 1960s, 1970s, into the 1980s to deinstitutionalize many of our mental health facilities and mental health hospitals across the country, and uh, the current um, push, if you will, was to use community-based treatment for those individuals that, you know, had um, lesser forms uh, of mental illness or were not as at risk, you know, of harming themselves or others. And they were, you know, pushed back into the community um, and that for, for lots of reasons, um, costs being one of them, and then also breakthroughs in, in therapy and outpatient treatment. Um, and uh, of course, the social stigma of um, mental uh, illness. So a lot of those people, you know, were pushed back into the communities and then ultimately uh, community service board people, mental health, community mental health people, the police, fire, EMS, and our local emergency rooms and hospitals um, saw them on a regular basis as a result of this, you know, deinstitutionalization. And many who were severely mentally ill or could not afford treatment found themselves living on the streets or in shelters. And unfortunately, that is, the, you know, the case today. And it's also been exasperated um, by another uh, aspect of special populations, and that's the immigrant po uh, immigrant population coming into the United States. Um, just like in our country, individuals who come from other countries are not void of mental health issues. Uh, matter of fact, many of them are coming here to the United States because they are seeking treatment and seeking a better way of life, and many of them have trauma and are, you know, um, have mental health issues associated with their plight. So it's not, it's, it's a double-edged sword um, when it comes to uh, mental health uh, issues in our communities. So <clears throat> like we just talked about a minute ago, the deinstitutionalization left police with few options and resources when dealing with the mentally ill. And so police officers and mental health workers and criminal justice system essentially became uh, the mental health system um, for the um, indigent and homeless population in all of our um, major communities. And, you know, U.S. jails and prisons also became the new mental health asylums simply because of the number of those who are entered into the criminal justice system who have mental health challenges. And so we've, the criminal justice system, the police, you know, specifically are at the tip of the spear, uh, if you will, here in dealing with the mentally ill, because we are normally the first people that come in contact with the mentally ill in a crisis. Um, we get called, it becomes a police matter. The police then get to uh, the scene and determine you know, what the situation is. And most of the time, if it deals with mental health, then we have to work the mental health processes um, that are designed within our community and our policies and procedures um, in you know, trying to uh, get individuals help uh, with their mental illness. <clears throat> so one of the, the cities that um, has had a substantial mental health crisis issue um, since about the 1990s is Memphis, Memphis, Tennessee. And um, 
So we have this Memphis model, and as a result of the Justice Department dissent decrees um, in Memphis, they were forced to provide more training to their officers based on the level and, and interaction uh, of their officers with mental with mentally ill uh, persons in their community. And so this crisis intervention training or CIT training um, really was kind of pushed to the forefront and piloted heavily in Memphis um, during this time. And officers learned to approach uh, the mentally ill by using body language and voice commands to de-escalate situations. Um, officers also learned um, diversionary options um, within the community. So not always taking somebody to, you know, a mental health facility or in trying to incarcerate them on an emergency um, custody order. And uh, so they also, the community invested in this mental health um, uh, posture as well uh, with the police department. And these programs um, were promising, but inconsistently implemented by police departments across the country. But in the wake of this mental health crisis that we have today, we're seeing a variety of trainings and approaches um, uh, that are uh, based on state law. So a lot of the legislatures now require police and criminal justice professionals, probation workers, um, social workers, uh, community uh, mental health um, workers or what we call sometimes mental, uh, um, the community services boards to um, have this crisis intervention training and make it mandatory um, along with other diversionary aspects of um, the mental health processes. So um, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about what it is like here in Virginia um, with regard to working with um, an, a person in mental health crisis. So um, what happens is the, uh, the police get called um, for a call for service. And if they determine that the person ha is having some type of mental health crisis, the law allows the police, um, community service board members, but ultimately the police um, hospitals um, to apply for and take into custody individuals in mental health crisis. And so when I say apply for, this would be an emergency custody order. Now, the police can take that person into custody if they deem in their uh, experience and or advised by a person within the mental health uh, community and or a physician or a licensed uh, clinical social worker, that this person is in mental health crisis. They can take that person into custody for their protection if they are deemed to you know, be a harm to themselves or others. And what that allows the police to do then is apply for this emergency custody order. And that emergency custody order, if it's granted, they have to go to a magistrate or a judge and apply for this emergency custody order. And usually they have you know, some testimony from, you know, the officer, maybe a family member or a mental health professional that adds, you know, um, a little bit of anecdotal examples of why they feel this person is in a mental health crisis um, to the magistrate. If that emergency custody order is granted, the police then take that individual to the hospital to get them med medically cleared. And so the difference is medically cleared versus mental health uh, um, Hold on one second. <clears throat> medically cleared versus mental health um, assessments. So medically cleared means that an individual, um, needs to be cleared so that they know that there's nothing physically wrong with them or that they're not on uh, or under the influence of alcohol or narcotics at the time, because obviously that would affect their mental stability. 
And once they're cleared from the hospital, there's, you know, the person doesn't have a heart condition or doesn't have diabetes and is in going into diabetic shock um, or something like that, or uh, some other um, physiological um, ailment, then they are taken to a mental health facility where they can be evaluated by a mental health profession, professional, usually a psychologist or a psychiatrist and they have, uh, they can hold them for up to 72 hours. Now, um, there's another kind of little hitch in this ECO is that you can hold that person for up to six hours while you're trying to get all of this, um, uh, this emergency custody order um, through the magistrate officer, through the court system. You can only renew that six hours once, so make a total of 12 hours. So for example, in a large jurisdiction, if you have somebody and you're holding them and you're the 10th person in line in the magistrate's office for an ECO, you're probably not gonna make that first six hour window. And you can only renew that six hour window once. And after that, if you don't do it, you have to release that person from custody. I mean, that means you physically, you can't hold them physically any longer. Now, they can stay with you if it's voluntary. That's not the that's that's not an issue. But if they are, you know, physically being detained by you, um, awaiting this mental health custody order, and it doesn't happen within the twelve hours, they you have to release them back into the community. Um, or back to where the, you, you pick them up. And then, you know, this whole process, you know, could start over again if the police were called again on a second, a second complaint. So once that, once that um, uh, uh, emergency custody order is, is granted and the officer has uh, taken that person to the hospital and they're medically cleared, then they be, they are transported to a mental health facility again, like. Uh, where I said they're evaluated by a psychologist or a psychiatrist and can be held there for up to 72 hours for evaluation purposes. During that time, after the first 24 hours, they would have, um, the reason the 72 hours, so if you took them in on a Friday, they could span the weekend and then have a hearing, what they call a custody hearing, the following uh, Monday to determine if that person needs to be held longer. And usually with that custody hearing is a judge hears that either in person or most of the time now they have it by, um, you know, some type of internet link like Zoom. And the judge then determines whether or not the, uh, you know, hearing from the uh, mental health professionals, whether that person needs to be held longer, and they go from a from an emergency custody order to a temporary custody order, which allows that the officers to uh, or the, the the state to hold that person for a longer period of time, based on the evaluation of those mental health uh, practitioners in the first seventy two hours, and so. That's the process in terms of dealing with an emergency issue or emergency custody order with a mental, uh, a mentally uh, ill uh, individual or, or a person with mental illness who is in crisis. So, um, you know, so it's common for the police to work with, the, you know, the mental health community, work with emergency rooms and hospitals, you know, in getting these emergency custody orders individuals clear. Uh, they usually have, um, I know in my department, my own department, uh, we had um, appointed mental health liaison officers, usually for each shift. And um, one was usually on call. So uh, if you know, there was an issue, they could guide you or advise you how to deal with some of these issues or come out and, you know, assist you, the patrol officer, in getting this um, emergency custody order issued or working through some of the bureaucracy um, to get that person in a better situation and be to get them evaluated. 
Um, so we begin to train uh, generalist officers uh, with you know knowledge about the full mental health processes. Um, depending on the community, uh, some officers might not have the you know they might see mental health uh, uh, people in mental health crisis, but never actually take a person into custody on an emergency custody order or work through those uh, problems associated with those emergency custody orders or and then the temporary detention orders after that. Um, so, you know, also, you know, the de-escalation piece is is vital, um, you know, again, because you're, you're based, you know, on my description of the special um, populations, you know, these people in mental health crisis are more likely to be victims not only of uh, of crime, but also of uh, police use of force because of the lack of uh, training or de-escalation tactics used in many departments. Um, so we, you know, also we re we target repeat offenders or repeat people in these, you know, hotspot locations, these homeless shelters, these. Um, in neighborhoods where there's a lot of indigent populations and try to provide them with, you know, enough support, mental health support, that they don't become a problem to the community. So um, another issue that we see is um, what we call special populations is um, the hidden crime of domestic violence. And it takes place in private usually and does not receive the same focus as other crimes that are committed in public. Although recently there has been a very big push on um, the domestic violence awareness. Um, and uh, we have a lot of community resources now in um, women and children's shelters and homes for domestic violence survivors. And so depending on the resources in your community, and most of it is, you know, how affluent is your community? How many shelters do they have? Oftentimes I remember trying to find shelter space for people, for victims of domestic violence, and the shelters are full, especially if you have children. Um, you know, those are premium, premium bed space for victims of domestic violence with children. And so we try to work with them and try to find family members or friends that are willing to um, take them in. The only problem with that is that you then run the risk of having family members and friends uh, thrust up uh, into the middle of could of potentially volatile domestic violence and sometimes and the you know friends and families have become victims themselves of uh, violence as a result of you know harboring or housing a um, a domestic violence survivor or um, a victim and so that's why we try to put people in shelters um, where you know, the locations are not known and there's some safeguards built into the systems and processes. Obviously, the, you know, the first person or the first places rather that some of these um, uh, domestic abusers are gonna look is, you know, nearest friends and family if they can't find, you know, the, their, um, their uh, domestic partner. Um, and so that becomes a, a problem and it puts other people and other um, family members at danger um, as well. So um, about 14% of all homicides involve domestic violence. And, and so that's really high in terms of, you know, what we see here is 14% uh, of all homicides are domestic related partner uh, on partner um, on violence. About 25 of all aggravated assaults um, involve domestic violence. So again, one quarter of all aggravated assaults um, are domestic related, which is pretty staggering when you think about it. Um, so there have been a lot of changes to the police response to domestic violence, um, especially since about the 1980s, 
there have been you know a number of fundamental changes to in police response to domestic violence I would say over the last 30 to 40 years um, and uh, one of those issues uh, associated with you know the changes in the police response to domestic violence is that the legislatures the state um, the people who make the laws in the state the legislature have taken it upon themselves to limit the discretion of police when dealing with domestic violence and so when I say limited discretion, the police have, you know, the, the a fairly great amount of discretion as to when to get involved in, some, in something and how much to get involved with and who to arrest and who not to arrest. But in this case, with domestic violence, the legislature, like I said, has taken the discretion away from police. Um, and this is a kind of a trend in many states you'll see this, um, and it's not just Virginia, but it's um, in, in most states across the, the nation, you'll find different variations of, of, this, of this domestic violence law, limiting discretion of police. And so, for example, the language in the code sections may change from, um, you may arrest upon evidence of domestic violence to you shall arrest upon evidence of domestic violence. And so in Virginia, it's kind of like this, that um, if the officers arrive at a scene and they determine that there is an issue of domestic violence and the officers find that there is one, um, evidence of assault, number two, they are domestic partners and they um, meet the criteria um, under the law for domestic violence, uh, you know, husband, wife, mother, father, uh, daughter, father, son, mother, um, you know, all the way down to people who are cohabitating and living a lifestyle that is, would indicate whether, um, be indicative of, of whether they would be um, carrying out a marital um, environment whether or not they are technically legally married, but they're living as if they were married and um, they have children in common. That's another one. Um, and it extends down to aunts and uncles and first cousins in terms of the, what they call the lines of consanguinity, which is the relationships. So those are kind of clearly set forth in the code section. So if you can determine that these two people meet the domestic statute and you see signs of assault and or you can identify the primary aggressor and you have in then the law says you shall arrest and that means you must arrest and if you can't if it's a mutual combat if there's signs of assault on both parties and they meet the criteria then you arrest both parties um, and so the state laws have now been changed to reflect this mandatory arrest policy in domestic violence. And so that, that evidence of assault can come in lots of different ways. You know, it can come in statements from the victim and the offender. It can come from a witness statement. It can come from the statement of children, family members, friends, you know, that would, um, cooperate one version of uh, the, an assault by one of the parties or both of the parties. And so, but your, your, your discretion is, is limited um, at best if it's, if it's not available at all, that you must then make an arrest of one or both parties in a domestic assault case. Then the other part of that domestic assault issue is that you then have to determine, you know, the threat that the offending party uh, um, imposes on the victim. So if this is something that's happened before, if it's the second time around, if a second arrest or a second or third call to the house um, for domestic violence, you know, there's a great a greater chance than not that this will continue. 
And as a result, um, there are certain criteria that you have to, are you then obliged to um, in, undertake um, according to the state law is that you then must apply for a protective order. And so you apply for that protective order in almost every case of domestic violence arrest, which that protective order protects the plaintiff, you're, you're, you're um, obtaining that protective order on behalf of the person who has been, been victimized. And that protective order then needs to be served on the respondent, which is the person who um, is the subject of any uh, assault um, or arrest warrant. And that protective order is what they, and the first uh, is an emergency protective order, which um, again um, allows just very similar to the ECO, the 72 hour rule, but the, the um, emergency protective order allows for 72 hours uh, bef before that emergency protective order can go back into the court in front of a judge to be reviewed whether it needs to be continued or enhanced in terms of the, of the timing and um, duration and, and strength of the protective order. So normally what happens is if you find a person or you've arrested that person who for domestic violence and you serve that protective order on um, they can't go anywhere near that victim for at least 72 hours. Within that 72 hours, you try to get back into the, the, um, the um, court and have that uh, protective order reviewed. And sometimes um, the, the judges will review it and leave it in place. And other times, you know, if there's been no issue, they will um, remove the protective order or continue the protective order um, for a period of time just to make sure that nothing uh, occurs um, during that particular time or while you're waiting trial or while the victim is um, trying to get their life back together or on their feet. Um, the court also has um, uh, victim, domestic violence, victim advocates, you know, so they have um, people that um, check up on victims of domestic violence, provide services and make sure those people get into certain counseling and programs. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's a lot of moving pieces here, both, you know, um, during the time of the initial report, arrest, issuance of protective order, um, the day or two after um, in, you know, pushing that protective order um, one way or another, and then some of the services uh, for victims of domestic violence. <clears throat> some of these uh, domestic violence and common police practices, you know, obviously, um, you need to be very careful in approaching domestic violence situations, um, you know, separating the parties, taking lots of photographs of the victims, um, collect additional evidence, you know, broken things, um, other um, warrants or protective orders from the past, all of those kinds of things are, are you know, uh, uh, you know, important. Um, you know, part of that evaluation of the protective order we talked about, you know, whether or not you're going to get one is performing what they call a lethality or threat assessment. And there's a process for that that you would provide to the magistrate and the court to, it's part of your affidavit for the issuance of that protective order. You know, how many times, what is the nature of the injuries, all of those things, you know, are part of the, the uh, threat assessment. Um, and then, you know, you look at conducting crime analysis of domestic violence, you know, not only from this particular victim's perspective, but also from the community perspective. And um, you have protocols for child protection in place, especially if the victim is um, been injured and has to go to the hospital and their children in the house. Well, you necessarily can't leave them with the offender because hopefully the offender is still there 
and you were able to arrest them. If the offender is not there and took the children, then you have a whole other issue um, um, on your hands. Um, so all of these things, you know, can complicate the issue of domestic violence. So uh, we talked about, you know, some innovative uh, responses to domestic violence. You know, Family Justice Center concept um, is the mission is to stop uh, the family violence, the cycle of family violence, and make victims safer, hold batterers accountable, and provide a long-term support for victims and children. So it's kind of like a one-stop shop, if you will, a help center um, that provides you know the majority of services needed by victims and families of domestic violence. And uh, again, you've, you heard me talk a little bit a, a minute ago about the domestic violence coordinators and, in police departments and um, prosecutors' offices. And we have these domestic violence um, uh, advocacy groups and um, domestic violence coordinators both in police departments and and uh, prosecutors' offices. You know, in Virginia, it's called the Commonwealth Attorney's Office, and some other places it's called the District Attorney's Office or the Court Liaison Units. And what these people do is they help, you know, kind of usher the process along so the victim doesn't always have to be the one to push for these uh, for this relief that these domestic violence coordinators and these um, domestic violence victim advocacy groups have individuals that can, you know, assist victims of domestic violence in knowing what to expect in the, expect in the court processes, how this case may move through the courts, what are some of the steps both in court and out of court that you can take to protect yourself and your family against uh, abusers of domestic violence. Um, and so it's, uh, you know, kind of a, a grown, you know, tenfold, um, like I said earlier, uh, in the last 30 years. And, you know, domestic abuse, you know, has lots of different signs to it. And a lot of these victims need counseling and, uh, you know, the children of the victims need counseling. Um, and, you know, services, so to kind of set them back on the right track. But it includes, you know, not just the physical nature, but, you know, you also have to look for signs of emotional abuse, you know, the name calling and the belittling and, you know, those kinds of things and the psychological abuse, the playing the mind games um, with victims, um, you know, taking, you know, the car from them, for example or not letting them, you know, uh, participate in group activities, isolating them from family and friends and cutting them off from those emotional support avenues. That's psychological abuse. Um, also, what is now we call financial abuse is, you know, not allowing them access to, you know, co-earned money or if one party works out of the house and makes all the money while the other party is a homemaker and stays home, they limit their ability to finances and only, um, you know, don't give them any money so they, they can't, you know, um, leave or they can't find resources out of the house, um, <clears throat> you know, spending money on themselves and not um, uh, together. Um, you know, making financial decisions in a vacuum. Only the one party makes financial decisions, leaving the other party, you know, at the mercy of the person who holds the purse strings and setting up accounts, you know, that have restrictions or in one name only, that kind of thing. Um, but yet keeping that person under their roof and in that kind of financial peril is also a form of domestic abuse. And we call it financial abuse. Um, now, you know, these domestic violence coordinators and these domestic violence advocacy groups are well versed in all of these different, you know, tactics and processes that abusers use to, you know, apply pressure to their victims 
not only not to tell, but not to prosecute and to, you know, um, return to a, a, an abusive environment or abusive relationship. Um, and, it, you know, there are psychological aspects um, that need to be, you know, um, overcome to allow somebody um, the emotional uh, freedom to get out of an abusive relationship. So, um, just one more thing uh, about uh, domestic violence that, um, you know, domestic violence comes in all shapes and sizes. It's not always, um, you know, same sex partners that are, uh, uh, I'm sorry, um, opposite sex partners that are uh, abusers and, and victims. It can be same sex partners that are abusers and victims. So, you know, try not to be um, stereotyped that, you know, uh, abuse only goes one in one direction. Abuse can go in many different directions. Um, and sometimes men are the victims of domestic abuse as are women or, you know, one party um, in a same sex relationship, um, same sex partners, you know, and you work these cases the same, you know, it doesn't, it, you, you should be their, their gender or their sexual orientation, you should be blind to that. You look for the, the evidence of abuse, just like we talked about earlier. Are there signs of abuse? Can you identify our primary aggressor? And do they meet the definition of um, domestic? Um, and it, you don't have to be married to be in a domestic relationship, um, at least not in the, in the Code of Virginia. You just have, there's some criteria there that, you know, you have to be living under the same roof and cohabitating um, in that environment as if you were married. So um, that's just one th a thing I wanted to, to, you know, double back on that I didn't relay to you earlier. So uh, let's talk a little bit about um, uh, immigration and policing U.S. borders. So there's an estimated 10.9 million undocumented immigrants in the United States today, um, and it may be higher than that. The numbers have declined slightly since 2003 and then peaked again during the last couple of years with the changes in the asylum seekers' court rulings. Um, and uh, they, you know, as a result of the asylum seekers' um, definition being broadened, it brought more and more people to the U.S. borders seeking asylum from other countries. And, uh, you know, there are lots of things um, that one could seek asylum from, uh, you know, in the United States from their homeland. Um, but um, you know, ideally what you're looking for is, you know, to reduce the number of, of immigrants at the border somehow, some way to make it a more orderly and a more cohesive uh, immigration, legal immigration um, into the United States. And so um, in order to do that, you have to, you know, reduce uh, the combination of possible factors by tightening the U.S. border security, um, changing the demographics in neighboring countries such as Mexico and Canada, <coughs> and looking at ways to reduce the overall flow of migrants um, to the U.S. border. So that's easier said than done. And you know now we've been through, in recent years, the Obama administration, the Trump administration, <clears throat> the Biden administration, and still we haven't had any decent um, <clears throat> immigration changes or policies at our U.S. borders. <clears throat> and, and actually all three of those administrations have in their own way um, exasperated 
uh, the border crisis in different ways at different times um, and for different reasons. Um, so it's not a real easy answer. And you, U.S. police officers, United States uh, municipal and state police officers are often caught in the middle. <clears throat> so, you know, you, know, you have to begin with trying to understand illegal immigration. The face of immigrants have changed. In the past, illegal immigration has tended to be young men who crossed the southern border seeking jobs and employment. And it wasn't about asylum. It was just a better way of life or fleeing, you know, a crime. Um, but without a, you know, final or defined definition of asylum. Now, the typical immigrant is uh, likely to be uh, 35 or older and has lived in the United States uh, for a decade or more, um, including single women with children and children, unaccompanied children, um, into the United States. <clears throat> so, you know, we have, you know, kind of a... Uh, a shift we are seeing, you know, this influx of families and single women and, and children, unaccompanied children in the United States, which was um, not necessarily the case 10 or 15 years ago. And that demographic also brings on a whole different set of problems when we're talking about housing and uh, assisting families, immigrant families, and not just individuals. Um, so it's not only a, uh, it's a crisis, it's a humanitarian crisis when women and children and families are involved versus just, you know, single individuals coming into the United, in, across the border. Um, so 62% uh, of Americans believe that undocumented immigrants should be allowed to remain in the United States if they meet certain criteria. <clears throat> And that number has pretty much been unchanged for the last decade. But 47% of Americans believe that the wall or fence would be built to secure, that should be built to secure the southern border. Um, and that's, you know, whether or not that works or not is, you know, uh, another debate. Um, but we've had vault walls and borders and, you know, they get walked around, get cut, get climbed over. And so ultimately you need to reduce the tide of immigrants, you know, showing up at the border and trying to cross the border. Um, and it, it's uh, not only dangerous for, <clears throat> you know, um, citizens of the United States who live on the American side of the border, U.S. side of the border, but it's also extremely dangerous for immigrants you know, who face, um, you know, uh, criminal elements and cartels uh, taking them here and, and then crossing, you know, deserts and, you know, um, swollen rivers um, to the Rio Grande in particular to cross and people drown all the time and, and die in the deserts and the high deserts of, you know, dehydration and things like that. So there was a program as part of the um, Immigration and Natural uh, uh, Nationality Act, INA, that became law back in 1996. Um, and it was uh, a section of that called 287G. So the 287G program was named after Section 287G of the Immigration and Nationality Act and became law as part of the um, Illegal uh, Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act of 1996. And through 287G, this program uh, provided state and local law enforcement officers uh, in collaboration with um, agencies of the federal government, the ability to enforce federal immigration law um, throughout the United States. And so the way this, this act worked is that <clears throat> if um, your, your local government would apply to the immigration and naturalization 
Service and Customs and Border Patrol um, to have uh, local police officers trained um, in this 287G uh, program. Once those officers were trained in 287G, they were deputized as immigration officers for the, the United States and <clears throat> they could enforce immigration laws um, just as if uh, they were federal agents um, dealing with immigration. And so there was uh, across the country, you know, back in this uh, 90s, there was a big push, you know, because this was all new. Um, you know, we had immigrants before, but the, the amount of immigration to the United States and the amount of illegal immigration to the United States was, you know, off the hook, even um, probably not as much as it is today, but it was just, it was a new face. It was a new fad, a new frontier for many, for many, you know, um, American communities. And they saw these immigrants showing up here with little or no resources, jobs, papers, um, couldn't speak the language, no education. And so they began to, you know, form communities within the communities. And um, these communities, you know, had issues with uh, assimilation into the, uh, you know, the U.S. way of life. And so um, members of the, uh, of the community found that it was, you know, necessary in their eyes to begin to have a greater stake in immigration enforcement and not just leave it up to the federal government. So the police, uh, on one hand, says, you know, um, this is probably not a good idea. We shouldn't probably be doing this. And, um, you know, we don't really care how these people got here. That's not our job. But now that they're here, we need to police them in a way that they uh, trust the police and provide us with information. And we can, you know, have uh, a good community relation with these groups. Well, the 287G program being forced down to local police did, did exactly the opposite. Um, once you came in contact with somebody, you could, from a lawful perspective, you could then, you know, ask them their immigration status. And if they weren't uh, here legally, you could take action um, through uh, providing both a civil or criminal detainer through the immigration system and having them in, incarcerated until they could get to a hearing, an immigration hearing and or their criminal hearing and or uh, deported from the United States. And so that alone created a huge gap or you know, artificially created obstacle between the immigrant community and assimilating to you know, uh, many American US communities across the country. And especially, and the police were caught in the middle. Um, the uh, city and county government says, hey, we want the police to enforce it. Police chiefs and police officers are pushing back from it. And these people say, well, if you want to remain police officers or police chiefs, then you're going to do what we say and you're going to enforce this immigration issues. And so that was kind of how it was kind of, um, you know, uh, put forward and kind of forced upon police to do that. And there are some models today. Um, there's the task force model and there's the jail model. Um, jail officers, sheriff's deputies, correction officers in local jails um, were granted this authority upon, you know, receiving the training as well. And they would, once a person was arrested and, and charged with a crime and incarcerated, they would immediately, you know, determine their immigration status and then take steps to, um, you know, um, uh, charge them um, either civilly with putting detainers, uh, immigration detainers on them or criminally um, putting uh, criminal detainers or criminal warrants for immigration violations on them while they're awaiting, you know, trials or incarcerated for local crimes, you know, just things like everybody else would be, anybody else would be arrested for drunk driving, assaults, domestic violence, you know, anything else. <clears throat> and so that created a huge gap uh, between the community and many of the immigrant uh, um, communities. Um, let's 
So, you know, the local police had to deal with these issues of undocumented aliens. And so, you know, one of the biggest issues here was, you know, what do we do with people now that we even, you know, charge them with a crime or they're in our community and now they're incarcerated in our uh, jails and, um, you know, part of our criminal justice system. And, you know, part of this 287G process was, you know, to be able to <clears throat> um, exercise basic immigration enforcement uh, laws in our communities. And um, so these models, uh, like we talked about before, you know, determine the immigrant status, identified false identification, notified foreign nationals in their embassies or consulates if they were these citizens of other countries were arrested and charged with a criminal act here in the United States. And then ultimately, whether or not they were uh, planning on to detaining them or civilly or criminally uh, for deportation. And then here are just some of the general Depu deputized officers uh, authorization act um, under 287G and <clears throat> what they were responsible for in doing is interviewing individuals, checking DHS databases for information, um, issue immigration detainers and hold individuals until ICE uh, Immigration Customs Enforcement could take custody of those individuals. Um, at one point, I remember that um, there were so many individuals in the Prince William County Jail under these ICE detainers um, that there was no room for anybody else. And uh, we used to have to, you know, call to determine whether or not there was room in the jail for other people um, who were going to be arrested and held, or we would have to take them to another facility <laughs> somewhere else in the state um, until, you know, uh, ICE would come and take all these detainers out of the jail. And one of the other issues was when this thing got, you know, really ramped up, this 287G process across the country, they didn't realize how efficient the local police and the sheriff's officers could be in dealing with, you know, in illegal immigrants you know, by detaining them. 70% of a lot of these jails were federal prisoners on detainers. And once, you know, one, if we were to arrest somebody and put them in jail, and that's on the state, but once we were determined that our state charges are over with, they became the prop, you know, they became financially uh, the responsibility of the federal government. A lot of these um, individuals were sitting in jail for a period of time awaiting hearings, deportation hearings, on detainers and they were racking up huge bills for the federal government to the point where ICE um, could not um, pay for a lot of these uh, detentions anymore. It wasn't in their budget. You know, they had over or under, under um, re, uh, uh, funded this process. Um, and they owed, you know, some of the states and localities quite a bit of money under the agreements, under these uh, memorandum of understandings of how they would handle uh, these incarcerations and transfer of non-citizens into ICE custody. So it was, uh, it was, you know, there was a lot going on at this particular time and a lot of problems um, in not only the communities, but in the apparatus designed to, you know, um, enforce immigration across the country. Um, illegal immigration and local government officials, you know, these sanctuary cities, cities known to protect undocumented immigrants from deportation if the federal uh, ICE violations were detected upon the arrest. So many of these cities decided, you know, they weren't going to get involved in this program and they weren't going to get involved and cooperate under um, uh, the deportation of immigrants across the United States. And so many cities that's got these monikers of sanctuary cities simply because either they didn't have the resources 
or they didn't agree philosophically or politically with the um, idea that they were going to arrest and, and hold people for immigration issues associated with their status here in the United States. And so again, you know, this is the rift between local government, state governments, and the federal government. Talk a little bit about human trafficking victims. So um, we call it, you know, the modern day slavery and it's connected to this immigration uh, process as well. So human trafficking is recruiting or harboring and transporting uh, provisions or obtaining of any person for labor or services through the use of force, fraud, coercion, and for the purpose of uh, subjected to involuntary servitude patronage, debt bondage, or slavery, including sex trafficking. So, um, you know, what happens is people come here or try to get here to the United States um, by way of illegal means, and they wind up as victims of human trafficking uh, and owing um, people who brought them here um, uh, you know, a tremendous amount of money or servitude or um, a patronage as a result of getting them here to the United States. It's estimated that about 2.4 million people are victims of human trafficking. About 70% are exploited as sex slaves or through the sex tourism industry at some point in time in their, in their um, process of getting here into the United States. Um, others are forced labor, such as domestic servitude and agricultural work, and, you know, low wages, long hours, um, no real uh, social accommodations in terms of, you know, um, their own living quarters or things like that. Um, you know, they're, they're housed together, they're taken to work, they're picked up, they're fed you know, barely fed, if you will. And these victims are often vulnerable, just like we talked about earlier, you know, these vulnerable people um, by way of special populations um, due to mental illness, drug abuse, family dysfunction, poverty, and just the stresses of having to live that kind of life here in the United States or by entering the United States, having to owe individuals who brought them here. Um, so many of these victims originated from countries around the world um, and can be U.S. citizens, but, you know, not going about it the right way, not entering the United States the right way could potentially um, hamper their ability to become citizens of the United States. Uh, So no one agency can prevent human trafficking or protect victims and uh, prosecute traffickers. You know, it's, it's a collaboration is really the key issue here in law enforcement, and it's both on federal, state, and local levels. Um, relationships between police and social service agencies must develop uh, before you know, they can address many of these issues um, and victims, you know, to be able to assist them. So you have to have kind of, you know, not only the enforcement piece, but you have to have the, the ability to recognize what's going on, provide the requisite services to individuals who are um, victims of human trafficking. And um, you see some of the federal agencies involved here, um, most of which come from the Homeland Security side, DHS, and that's Customs and Border Patrol, or CBP, Immigration, Customs Enforcement, ICE, Homeland Security Investigations, the FBI. Um, uh, you know, they have jurisdiction over people being transported between state lines for um, uh, you know, involuntary servitude. This is called the Mann Act. Um, and uh, slavery and or sexual exploitation of victims. And then most of the time they're, you know, found and dealt with by state and local police officials 
you know, who raid a house, who observe a truck, who, you know, full of people, who watch, you know, uh, a business, um, you know, having issues with their employees, and it all leads to back to human trafficking and or, um, you know, some of these immigration issues that we spoke about before. There was this uh, <coughs> T visa um, created um, in 2000 um, to allow some victims of human trafficking and their qualifying family members to remain in the United States if they assist um, law enforcement uh, to build cases against these traffickers. And uh, this was necessary because once you, you know, you wanted to prevent these traffickers from continuing this, this behavior and continuing this cr criminal enterprise. And so you needed some of these victims to be available to the state and federal prosecutors um, to be able to get information and use against them uh, the traffickers in, in court. And so we had to provide some stability uh, to these victims and their families in this form of issuing T visas, uh, T for human trafficking, um, and uh, provide them some stability in their, in their life. <clears throat> some of the other resources available for human trafficking under the Department of Justice, Office of Victims of Crimes, uh, OVC, funding for anti-trafficking programs, you know, from both the federal and state level, uh, other victim case management, legal issues, clinical intervention, housing, medical care, you know, some, you know, these people have to be taken care of um, and, and not just thrust upon the local social services system because they weren't funded properly for that to take on the number of, of uh, um, individuals needed to support at the local level. So some of this funding had to come from the federal government in a trickle-down fashion through these programs. Um, Department of Justice Office of Justice Programs and Diagnostic Center employee data-driven strategies to assist local agencies with, you know, numerous crime problems associated with human trafficking and smuggling of, of persons um, and immigrants into the United States. Um, so we're looking at now, you know, being able to find, you know, data-driven tools to help track some of the statistics about where these things are occurring and at what rate they're occurring. There's... Uh, <clears throat> A lot of, of organized crime, especially uh, gang-involved crime in human trafficking, sex trafficking rings are increasingly run by criminal gangs, both domestically and internationally. Um, human trafficking is the fastest growing criminal enterprise, followed closely behind by drug trafficking, child pornography, that's internet, and the proliferation of illegal arms trade across the world. So there's money to be made today, even today, with human trafficking. It, it's, um, you know, it's not as, it's not as um, fruitful as drug trafficking and child pornography um, from the internet perspective, but it is, it is profitable to some, especially some who have, you know, uh, really good uh, resources in trafficking um, across uh, the U.S. borders of individuals for uh, criminal activity. Um, so, you know, there are a number of agencies involved in tracking uh, criminal activity in gangs and human trafficking. Um, again, uh, HSI, Homeland Security Investigations, um, and the FBI primarily make up the bulk of those uh, federal agencies. And then, of course, any state and local agency that comes across victims of human trafficking and or sexual exploitation, um, you know, are involved to some degree. And there's many task force set up across the country to help deal with this. And lastly, we're going to talk about uh, crime in the elderly. Um, we call it uh, crime in gerontology. So the baby boomer population, which is my population, <clears throat> my, my, 
my uh, generation, if you will, is the largest segment of the population in the United States right now. Those people born between 1945 and 1965 make up the majority of the population of all, <coughs> all generations. Um, aging population in the workforce, so, you know, as it becomes more and more expensive to live and work and, you know, uh, that pop people are working longer and longer. They're not retiring as young as they used to. And so you have an aging population in the workplace. And as a result of that aging population in the workplace, you expose these aging people to more and more opportunities for victimization. Conversely, you also have a larger aging offender population, you know, uh, the prison population is aging at a fast rate too. So you're not dealing with as many uh, offenders, for example, who are 18 to 35, you're dealing with more per by percentage of offenders who are 45 to 65 years of age. Why? Because of the same demographic in, of baby boomers who make up a, a large percentage of the population. And these offenders are out there and a larger percentage of the population are aging and then therefore there's a larger percentage of aging offenders. Um, so you can see that there is that correlation between the age demographics in both victims and offenders um, and uh, those people um, who are incarcerated and or part of the criminal justice system or con make contact with the criminal justice system at a later, later age. So uh, technology is also adding to victimology of, you know, the scammers, the ability to scam the aging population um, via the use of technology. You know, aging victims don't understand the technology. They don't have the same wherewithal and resilience and um, are not as uh, um, understanding and or uh, use, you know, technology is not as user friendly to them um, as it is to the younger generations and therefore they become victims of, <laughs> of fraud and scams at a higher rate. Um, and at the same time, you know, uh, there are also fewer victim services for the aging population. You know, we seem to have put everything in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s <clears throat> into, you know, the younger demographic, that 18 to 25 year old, you know, um, a group of, of offenders. And now we have, and victims, and now we have an aging group and they require a different set of services and different needs than their youthful predecessors. Um, so these are all challenges um, uh, for policing and the response to policing different communities. Um, these are just, like I said, you know, kind of a few of the most prevalent special uh, populations within our communities. Again, these populations, you know, cross, you know, the aged, the trafficking, the immigrants, they cross all, um, you know, races, religions, ethnic boundaries, um, and age groups. And, um, you know, we find them in every, in every corner of our communities. Um, and it, these are just, again, special considerations that we need to uh, think about when dealing <coughs> with a crime in our communities and these special populations associated with, you know, what we do, um, you know, policing our communities and, you know, making them either safer um, or increasing the quality of life in our communities. And that includes the quality of life, even for people who are elderly or with mentally ill or previous victims of domestic violence or immigrant families um, who, you know, made it to the United States and, you know, now have to, you know, find a way to, to either stay here and become, you know, citizens of the United States as well. So um, I hope that uh, you gleaned some information from this uh, uh, lecture about special populations and some insight about why things are the way they are. 
especially the mental health arena and the domestic violence arena. Um, those are, you know, two big ones um, that are of, certainly of interest to many communities as well as the immigration issue. Um, but that's all I have for you today. Um, next, we're going to be talking about technology and policing and how technology has affected policing in um, lots of different ways. So with that, take care and we look to talk to you again soon.